Okay, so uh, as many of you know, most of our work in neuroendovascular and neurointervention uh, happens in a biplane angiography suite, kind of like this one that you see here. And for many years, and we're going to see examples of this, we were toiling away with kind of what we had. And now, recently, uh, we're right back to the front of the queue with the Icono unit, which is the name of the Siemens unit that we use here. So we wanted to let you know what that means in terms of the different things we're able to now offer patients and different glimpses uh, into the future of what we're able to do with the machine. So we're going to spend some of our time exploring the history and fundamentals of neurointerventional radiology, broadly speaking, and then specifically here in London as well. And then after that, switch to ways in which this unit has allowed us to do different types of things and answer different types of questions in the suite. And then lastly, pivot towards looking ahead. So neuroendovascular in London has a long, long history, going back to Dr. Charlie Drake here. Though Dr. Drake was an open neurovascular surgeon, meaning that he didn't himself practice these techniques, he was never threatened by the possibility and in fact went the other way, flying himself to France to recruit our first neurointerventionalist in London, Dr. Gerard de Brun. And since that days of Drake, the program has only continued to grow. Uh, we train fellows, some of whom you've seen over the course of this program, and their senior staff from this fellowship of the last 15, 20 years that are currently on staff in Toronto, Hamilton, Edmonton, Halifax, Atlanta, LA, da, 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 and many former fellows that have gone on to be the president of our primary international society, the SNIS. This fellowship's produced three of them. So, the history of neurointerventional imaging does unfortunately, uh, or does fortunately include the development of rotational angiography, including many people in this audience that were seminal to that work. Here you can see not just a rotational angiogram, but trying to implement rotational angiography actually into the operating room. And that required development of fixed clamps that are also going to be radiolucent to allow us to operate on complex three-dimensional shapes and do it in real time. And these are real videos taken from here and from Robarts and from the first edition of the Angio Suite to the OR, which is at UH and OR9. Uh, at that time, the machine was called a Zigo, uh, showing how it was implemented. Here you can see the same kind of technology being applied to the actual angiography suite. And so this was our way of doing, you know, an earlier version of something that we just saw, taking a two-dimensional imaging platform and applying it to a three-dimensional space so that we can better understand that. Before this, of course, we were limited when treating an aneurysm just to how we were able to see it in any one plane. This allowed us almost to hold it in our hands and see it from all dimensions. But as exciting as a place as this was, and as much innovation as what was happening, even with that kind of head start, if you don't keep running, you're going to fall behind. And so in a way, this is a snapshot of where we were if we were to go to tortoise and the hare type analogy. This is a picture I took of our Anjo suite, and more days than not, it would look something like this uh, in 2021. But if we go to today, now the Anjo suite and the program serves as a stroke hub for this part of the province. So we're doing about 230-ish stroke thrombectomies a year. It's the aneurysm hub for both adults and children. And fortunately, this is why we have to go a little earlier. And in total, we're treating about 600 patients a year. To give you a sense of the catchment area, this is what it looks like. So that's larger than, of course, many countries. But now that we have a little sense as to where we've been with the program, we're going to stop for a minute and switch to what we can now do with this Angio Suite so you can get a sense as to exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, so Dr. Pandey did a really good job there kind of highlighting in the past some of the great things we've done. And uh, I had the pleasure last week of speaking at the Canadian Association of Interventional Radiology and got to witness uh, our residents, fellows, and some of our staff speak there. And I can say, that uh, London is still very much in the front of the field and uh, some very impressive stuff coming out of here. So as we uh, all worked in our modalities to kind of optimize the equipment, we've all been handed the next generation of equipment. So, you know, the first step in kind of moving that technology forward is understanding the technology itself. So uh, this is an example of our new um, biplane system when the, uh, with the two cameras spinning together. So 
This offers faster imaging, which uh, which needs different injection protocols and acquisition protocols to really optimize. So, as with all IR procedures, kind of the bread and butter is the DSA images. So you can see here, just standard DSA images um, are still kind of the uh, the highest detail and resolution images we take. But increasingly, more often, we're relying on rotational imaging. So rotational imaging is essentially kind of lower resolution images that are taken in in, uh, in sequence around the patient to create a really high detailed 3D map. So we're able to take the, the 2D imaging and kind of use that to uh, plan and navigate, but then we use the 3D rotational imaging to, uh, to really understand the anatomy. And uh, our interventional radiologists use these 3D models to, uh, to really plan the, the best treatment angles for the aneurysms and so that they can really visualize their parent arteries and the aneurysm in profile and make sure that they're delivering the devices properly. And you know, to further complement that, once the devices are delivered or partially delivered, uh, evaluating their location in relationship to the artery is very important. So by con combining two different imaging data sets together, uh, what we call a dual volume, they're able to really assess the uh, devices in the, in the arteries in, uh, in, in one volume. So, you know, uh, our older system used to have one uh, 3D protocol, uh, and it was the only one we used. With our new generation of imaging equipment, you can see this is just a fraction of the available uh, imaging techniques. So really taking a deep dive and understanding what exactly it is we have. Um, one key question for, for all the uh, exams is how long they take. So when the patients are intubated, time's not really a factor, but um, when they're awake or when we're worried about the amount of contrast we're gonna use in longer procedures, having really long acquisition times requires us to inject more contrast. So we really don't want to utilize the long injection protocols if we don't have to and then subsequently the number of images they take. So you can see it's a pretty busy slide, but some of these acquisition protocols might be the same amount of time, but some will take double or triple the amount of pictures. So that's more radiation to the patient, and they kind of result in higher image quality, but not always. Uh, it really depends what you're imaging. When we're injecting contrast and we're doing two sweeps, we don't really need to use that much radiation because we have really high subject contrast. So sometimes these acquisition protocols can be used incorrectly and in, 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 um, cause increased radiation dose to our patients. So. Having that kind of capability and seeing that chart that you just saw should hopefully bring to mind then that yes, there are a bevy of options now in front of us, but it's an entirely different thing to figure out what's the best one and what's the best situation. And also, this is how they may come out of the box, but how do we tweak and optimize them for a specific patient? So I thought this is a good time for us to pause and think about how these might be applied in a real patient. So this was a gentleman who came to us uh, just a few months back, camping with family and was found collapsed on a dock in the morning. I'll show you quickly just a CT scan. All the white stuff that you can see there around that red arrow is blood that's not supposed to be there and it's spilled out around the brain. And when we see this, your heart sinks because that's a scary moment for that person. And so I'll take you through, you know, the very crude level questions that go through my head, and then we can think about how the technology may inform our ability to answer or act upon those questions. So first thing you think of is, gosh, is there an aneurysm here? That's a pretty basic question. And to answer that, we can kind of use pre-2022 technology, like a, the CT, like the CT angiogram, and like those 2D angiogram runs that John just showed us. Okay, so we bring a patient and we do a 2D angiogram. Here's a picture where I'm injecting into somebody's vertebral arteries. We thought the blood might be coming from back there somewhere. And I can see the basilar artery and a number of other arteries, but gosh, it's pretty tough to say for sure, is there an aneurysm there or not? So why don't we zoom in a little bit? Why don't we inject a little bit more forcefully? These are all tools we've had available to us for a long time. And in doing that, we can now see a little bit of a haze at the top of the basilar artery that turns out to be an aneurysm. And here is that 3D volume rendered image that John just showed us that shows us that aneurysm. You can see it pointed out there with that red arrow. Okay, so we've identified a problem and we've identified what we think is the source of that problem, but there's a whole bunch of other issues here. If you take a look at where that red arrow is, you'll see that just on top of that, there's a branch sticking straight up. So that branch is feeding a critical part of the base of our brain, our thalamus. And is that branch coming from the aneurysm or near the aneurysm? These are critical questions because if I'm gonna go up there and block it off like a crude person, 
am I going to cause some devastating collateral damage to this person or not? So these are the kinds of questions are running through my head. And to be frank with you, on that picture that we showed you of the machine with all the equipment and under repairs, we would have no meaningful ability to resolve that question. So the only way we would do it is just try to put some metal strings in there called coils, hope that the aneurysm doesn't burst, and also hope that we didn't cause this person devastating collateral damage at the same time. With that list of new types of imaging options, now I can go to my colleague and say, what is our way to try to unravel or untangle that mystery? And I'll show you what some of those images look like. This is a very fuzzy, nasty looking picture. But remember, we're not using this to make the most beautiful picture. We're trying to use this to answer the most functional question. So as we go through it, and as I tip it over, you can see as I pause there with that red arrow, now I can clearly see the aneurysm is totally separate from that branch that was right near it. This might look really, really obvious, in the real person's brain, that's far less than a millimeter's worth of difference. We're about half a millimeter difference there that we can now independently resolve to be two different structures, and that radically changes our whole treatment approach. Okay, so John has helped me there, and we've been able to leverage the equipment to answer an important question. But as you saw in the first picture I showed you of the aneurysm, I could barely see that thing. It looked like a fuzzy little smudge, best case. So how do we actually see what we're doing as we're treating it? Same idea. If we now try to say, we've got all this incredible data in the form of a CTA, in the form of the angiogram, why are we only using one piece of data, the live fluoroscopy, while we're treating it? The person's asleep. I don't have to deal with these horrible things my body colleagues do, like breathing or hearts. So nothing's moving. So we can try to co-register these images if we can do it at an incredibly high fidelity and then use that to guide our treatment. So that's an option that we would have previously not been able to offer. Here you can see I've got a catheter sticking where I think the aneurysm is, another catheter nearby as a balloon to settle my heart rate in case I burst it, and we can superimpose upon it a volume rendering of that first 3D image that I saw. So now I know when my coils are ping-ponging around, are they in the space I want them to be or not? And you can imagine that's a considerably comforting thing to have in front of you. So this high fidelity rotational angiography already in the first year is starting to unlock choices and take down the risk of the people that we're treating day to day. Yes, yeah, so, so the, um, the Im imaging itself is one piece of the puzzle, but the, the next thing that we, uh, we really brought forward with this grant and uh, in our neuro department is uh, a new form of power injector. So dual head injectors in CT departments are extremely common. In fact, I think every CT scanner has a dual head injector. Um, but in angio suite, there's only one available at the moment and uh, we're the only center in Canada that has it. And really what it offers is as we start deploying different imaging acquisition protocols, we need to use different um, concentration of contrast. So the little chart here does a great job of showing um, for a lot of our high resolution images like this one here of the aneurysm, we want full strength contrast. We use a low amount of radiation and a high concentration of contrast. So we get a really good high subject contrast and we can get really high quality pictures without needing to use extra radiation. But when we're dealing with um, flow diverter stents, which Dr. Pani is going to go over a case here in a second, we want to dilute the contrast because you can see the pictures on the left hand side of the screen. If we was, were to use the full strength contrast, we wouldn't be able to visualize that stent. Previously to using this dual head injector, we would have to inject either by hand, which meant our clinicians had to stand directly beside a very high dose acquisition protocol. Uh, and we, we normally got inconsistent images, or we could dilute our power injector. And contrast and saline do not sit, stay suspended together. Uh, and we also need to use that full, full strength contrast again, multiple times during the procedure. So that would add a significant amount of time and also the risk of adding uh, air embolus into the procedure. So you can see here uh, with a different acquisition protocol than we used previously was a 14 second uh, micro CT. So this is micro CT uses higher levels of radiation and lower amount of contrast, but it gives us really high detail wall acquisition pictures to, for the radiologist to assess um, the stent position. Uh, this wouldn't be able to be accomplished with a full strength contrast.
And then when it comes to the deploying the stand itself, um, what you see under the good is uh, our fluoro. This is on our new system. I can tell you our old system they, was basically invisible. Um, and you can see that there's a stent, uh, multiple stents and some coils, and, and they're hardly visible. So obviously the uh, fluoro is the lowest amount of radiation, which we'll use for 99% of the procedure. And the only technique we had was a single shot. So that was one single picture that gave the detail to visualize the stent. And with the new imaging system, we're trying out the neuro device fluoro, uh, which you can see on the right. So that's a real time, uh, seven and a half frames per second. And it, what it does is it uses the technology that stacks multiple images together. So it doesn't need to increase the amount of radiation to get those high quality pictures. This is a very new, uh, a new feature for us. So we've been uh, using it and, uh, and it's built directly into our pedal. So. So now that we have the ability to inject varying amounts of contrast, and we have the ability to see with high resolution, high resolution fluoroscopy, we can translate this back to what does it mean for our patients. So John had mentioned something called flow diverting stents. These are kind of high, me high density mesh stents that have changed the types of aneurysms we're able to treat. Instead of the first case we looked at, where we're going inside the aneurysm, losing years off our life and trying to pack it up, this approach is saying, why don't we rebuild the healthy artery below the aneurysm and not deal with the aneurysm at all, and hope that our mesh might act as a scaffolding for the healthy cells inside our arteries, the endothelium, to reheal and reform. So that's how it works in concept, but then in practice, like everything, it doesn't always work. So why doesn't it work? Where do we fail? What we believe where we fail is if the stent is not lined up properly, of course, and just like stents in other parts of the body, if it's not opposed appropriately to the end lumen of the wall itself of the artery. So if the stent isn't touching the wall of the artery, how can the arterial cells heal over the stent? It's not going to work, it's going to leak, and the aneurysm might never close down. So, when we're doing the treatment in real time, we need to be able to answer those questions. And even though we've had this treatment now for about eight to 10 years, up till recently, we haven't been able to answer those types of questions. So what we wanna know, there's an example of what a flow diverting stent looks like, by the way, so that you can visualize it other than just my hand gestures is, is it touching the artery wall? Is the patient okay or not? So here's an example of that exact flow diverting stent and these exact type of cone beam CT type reconstructions that we had up until very recently. So I'll thumb through a few of these for you. And I want you to think as you look at that squiggly white line, can I tell apart where is contrast in that artery and where is the stent? Maybe you can, but for me, it's not easy. On one slice, I can hallucinate that I can. And then I would give a high five to my colleagues, say, we probably nailed it and we're out of the room, but we won't know if we did a good job for six to 12 months, depending on how the patient did. Let me contrast that for you. Again, remembering these are the questions we're trying to answer with what we're able to do now. And I deliberately picked an example here where you can see there's a big white ball of metal. So that's a coil pack in this aneurysm. That should make this picture much, much harder to acquire. But if we dilute the contrast, and if we can acquire images at a higher resolution, granted with an increased radiation dose, now we can get pictures that look like this, where we can see the stent, we can see exactly where it is and is not touching the artery wall. If I pause here, you can see on one side of the stent, there's a thin little gap where it's not touching the arterial wall. So that then lets me in real time before waiting six to 12 months, go back in there and choose to balloon angioplasty it, put this person through some more risk, but we think at least for more benefit. In the past, if we were doing it, frankly, we were just guessing. Our hope is that one day, even this will be obviated by things like OCT that we could deploy inside the arteries of the brain, but we're not there yet. And this is a radical leap forward, hopefully you can appreciate that compared to what came before. So, We've covered two kind of areas in which this has taken us forward. One, higher fidelity cone beam angiography. Two, higher fidelity fluoroscopy and ability to dilute contrast dynamically in real time. And now we're gonna stop and talk about ways that we might even save the fluoroscopy to begin with.
Yeah, so the, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, image fusion. So image fusion is done on a lot of different systems, and um, it can also be done on our interventional suite. Essentially, what you're doing is taking two different imaging modalities or two different imaging studies and, and combining them together. This can be a, a, a valuable tool for the people to be able to visualize structures. I know for myself, I'm not overly experienced in looking at MRI or, or other imaging, but if I overlay a CT angio that we did on top of it, it makes a little bit more sense for me. So essentially, this is an example of a Dyna CT uh, and a uh, um, MRI superimposed on top of each other. So you're able to see the arteries that we enhance with our selected injection uh, overlaid onto the patient's MRI. So really assessing the arteries in relationship to their AVM. And, uh, and so you, you think about, okay, how can we apply that to a patient? Well, let's take the example of intracranial hypertension. This is a very common pathology, unfortunately. It seems to only affect women it seems to only affect young women in particular, and that's a pretty radiosensitive population. Well, we don't want to be blasting their radiosensitive lens or thyroid glands with uh, radiation if we can avoid it. So until now, we've had this treasure trove of information like MRIs available to us, and we just have to kind of mentally co-register them with our head and then repeat all the fluoroscopy once we're in the room with a patient. Here's an example of these types of patients get these veins that are really pinched down. And one of the treatments we offer is to open up those veins. So if you see the red arrow, you could see a pre and a post, and we'd have to irradiate the person to acquire all of those images. So if I have a slide like this one developed by John, where we can co-register ahead of time, we can then lock on where those veins are supposed to be in the head. These are not very challenging structures to navigate through. We don't need to keep radiating, getting subtracted images during the procedure. Of course, there's still some live x-ray as we navigate the wire, but it's a considerably lower dose if we can pre-op fuse. And that's a real advantage we have in the head where everything is more or less in a fixed volume that up until now, though it may seem unbelievable to our scientist colleagues, we haven't really been fully leveraging. Additionally, this type of fusion can allow us to find a needle in a haystack. Here's that same angiogram that we started off with, and this was a picture of somebody with a brain AVM. If it just looks like a black cloud of gobbledygook to you, that's how it looks to us too, and we look at these all day. And so when we're treating them, we want to find the one millimeter site inside there that might be the culprit. So how do you do that? Well, the angio will be part of the story, the CT will be part of the story, and the MR will be part of the story. And then it's up to you to kind of stitch those together. Now, I can go to John nowadays and say, can we fuse all the stories together? Because I'm a simple person. I just want to look at one thing. And in doing that, we're able to now more precisely target what we think is the single culprit. So here would be an example of putting those together. So in our last few minutes here, we're just going to pivot and look ahead. Yeah, so we did a, a good overview of some of the features we're using today. But there's a few pieces of technology that we've, we've just got handed to us and we're, and we're just in the early stages of kind of developing. So uh, sinusoidal spins are a, a new addition to the angio suite. Um, I know in CT we angle the gantry regularly, but all the uh, axial images are acquired in the same plane. Having the system kind of woggle as it goes around the patient gives multiple different projections, which kind of can potentially improve the uh, mathematical algorithm. So uh, very early on, we've done a, a few of these scans, uh, an example here and really kind of assessing it with, uh, with the RADs and finding out when, uh, when they feel like it would be uh, a good application. And uh, there was a pretty big study done in Barcelona about the angio first technique. Uh, they used that sinusoidal spin as an aspect uh, to see about the amount of infarct in the brain. And then they followed it up with a, a 10 phase um, Dyna CT. Um, so they uh, had a dedicated angio system only for stroke. Uh, Canadian healthcare system, that's not going to happen. We can barely uh, fit the work we have in our angio suites. Um, so working here in London with, uh, these are some images uh, processed off of uh, an Icono system by Dr. Ting Lee. Uh, working with the data we have and our, and our stroke fellows to try and kind of highlight a certain patient population that we can benefit. So in that study, they were able to demonstrate a, an average of 20 minutes from door to treatment uh, reduction. Um, of course, with everybody imaged on the angio system, but if we can select certain patients, that's uh, something we want to explore in, in neuro IR. And um, I'll pass back to Dr. Bonnie here. Yeah, so as we wrap up then in the last minute here, 
th this is kind of the central question that we're examining going forward in a systematic way. The bottom line, as I showed you at the beginning, that was a pretty big map of a big catchment area that we're dealing with. And the biggest volume of cases that we started with was those 230-ish strokes. And that's the group where we really know minute to minute absolutely counts. So if we have an answer suite that because of what John showed us with those sign acquisitions and the rapidity of the acquisition can start to mimic the CT perfusion images that we're stopping in the CT scanner for, can we skip the CT scanner altogether in selected patients? So this is something we're just at the beginning of examining. As John mentioned, till now, it's only been examined in certain very niche high resource situations like in Basel, Switzerland, and in parts of Spain specifically. So we'd like to examine it and see, A, can we do it as well or better than they can? B, can we figure out when to apply it in cases where you don't have 30 extra angio suites? And C, can we develop our own perfusion reconstruction algorithms that are as good or better than what is commercially on the market? So that's kind of a brief glimpse ahead. We're at the end of our 25 minutes, so we should just stop now and summarize. We're really appreciative of the attention. What we wanted to cover was where we've been as a program, some of the features we're able to unlock now and leverage for patient care, and then a glimpse ahead at hopefully further eliminating the CT scanner from the algorithm of care for stroke patients. Thank you for your attention.